uh, in England. Queen Elizabeth died in 1603. Hobbes was 15. And James I became king. Um, you might have heard of um, the so-called gunpowder plot. So this was something that happened just two years later in 1605. There was a large uh, stash of gunpowder that was discovered under the Parliament building and was attributed, maybe rightly, maybe wrongly, to uh, a Catholic attempt to assassinate James I and the entire Parliament. So, you need to imagine like Al Qaeda planting a bomb under the Capitol in an effort to blow up the Capitol and Congress and the president. It's that level of um, thing. Um, so, right from the beginning with James, there was tension and uh, instability. And in particular, there was a growing tension between, growing conflict between James and the Parliament. When he died in 1625, his son became Charles I, and the conflict between Charles I and Parliament continued to um, grow. Eventually, um, in 1642, Charles had his guards invade the parliament to try to arrest some of the parliamentary leaders, but they had been tipped off and were not there. Um, and Charles was forced to flee London. Um, a few months later, he gathered together his army and civil war broke out. And the civil war lasted more or less until 1649 when he was executed. And so this started the so-called interregnum period between kings, when England was ruled by um, Parliament. And this lasted until 1660, when Charles II um, came to power. Oh, so to repeat, this is a period of very high, so notice the date of publication of the book right in the thick of this. Um, this is a period of very high political tension and instability and uncertainty, as well as the period of the birth of modern science, early forms of capitalism and market relations. Um, and it's worth remembering that many of these political and social conflicts and disagreements were expressed in um, religious terms. Let me mention one more thing here. Um, I said that the traditional justification of political rule was divine right. So that the so that the monarch is authorized by God's rule. But really, that's only, as it were, the tip of the iceberg. Um, because what God did on this theory is not just pick out the one person to rule. What God has done is establish what's sometimes called the great chain of being. So what God has done on this too is not just pick out one point at the top, but established an entire hierarchy, an entire natural hierarchy, where there is this one individual at the top. But everybody else has a role that is established by God. Everybody else, from the monarch at the top down to the lowliest peasant, has an assigned role and needs to fit into that rightful place. So this period of time that we've just been talking about is a period in which this natural hierarchy and this natural order is really being thrown into death. It's at this period that the great chain of being is being upended and thrown into, into doubt. Um, and part of the reason for this really has to do with the 
um, the intellectual changes, the scientific changes. Because instead of simply accepting religious dogma um, as truth, some people are beginning to use their own reasoning ability, like they do with the scientific method and the natural sciences. They're beginning to use their own reasoning to question the organization of society, to question this established. Now, on different historical theories, different elements of this period influence the changes in different ways. So some people think religious uh, factors are the most important. Other people think economic changes are the most important. Um, we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to um, resolve that. All I want to emphasize um, is that Hobbes was right in the thick of all of these. Hobbes, um, just a few years after Galileo was condemned by the Catholic Church, Galileo went to visit him in Florence. He was very interested in the natural sciences. Um, and as Parliament became more and more defiant of the king in England, Hobbes was forced to flee England for Paris. So as I mentioned, Leviathan was published in 1651, just two years after the execution of Charles. Um, as you will see when we uh, start talking about Leviathan, as you will see, uh, Hobbes was a defender monarch. Hobbes was a defender of political rule by a monarch. And in fact, he had been, while in Paris, he was the tutor to the young Charles II. Um, but in the years after, he alienated himself more and more from his former student, as well as uh, the Republican anti-monarchist, um, uh, anti obviously. Um, and he wrote a history, when he wrote a history of the English Civil War, um, he was not granted permission to publish it. Now this seems largely to have been because while Hobbes defends monarchy, he does not defend it on divine right theory, on the basis of God. So we'll see how he gives a defense of monarchy. We'll see the assumptions that he makes and the argument that he makes for it. But there are, but it's basically based on his defense of monarchy is basically based on a certain assumptions of equality among individuals and consent. So he's completely rejecting the picture of the great chain of being that I described to you a minute ago. OK. Any questions about that so far? Okay. Now philosophy. So I need to paint here um, a very, very big picture. Um, I just want to describe to you some important themes or changes over 2,000 year history. So I can only gesture towards these in a few minutes. So here we go. If we go all the way back to ancient Greece, and travel all the way from uh, Plato and Aristotle, all the way through the medieval period, right up to the time, the period of time that we're talking about. The dominant tradition in ethics treated ethics as the investigation into the world, an investigation into what makes a human life good? So there are differences, of course, between Plato and Aristotle and Aquinas, for example. They don't all agree. 
may disagree about the nature of the good life. But for each of them, ethics is concerned with understanding the good. Ethics is concerned with understanding what is the good for a human being. What is it that makes a life good? So we can think of, how do we think about this? We can think of, of course, individual things, individual items that we think are good or valuable, or maybe the actions that produce them as being good or valuable. And we can think of these different goods, these different valuable things or different valuable actions, as being arrayed in a hierarchy or um, a system. So we might ask, why is coming to class a good thing? Well, one answer might be, why is coming to class a good thing? Yeah, you pay for it, you don't make money. So it will waste of money. And so um, why did, so, so. You get what you deserve. OK, but what would you get? What, what do you get from coming to class? Maybe some professors are boring and we'd rather be out on that. So you get an education. Okay, so you get an education. So coming to class is good because it helps you get an education. Maybe because it'll help you pass the test. Because maybe the professor is going to ask you the questions that are based on what he said in class. So getting an education might be a good thing. Maybe getting a good grade. So why, why would you want to grade in a class? So you graduate. Okay, so coming to class is important, be, is, is a good thing, is a valuable thing, because it contributes to getting a good grade. You can ask why is getting a good grade a valuable or a good thing? And that's because that'll help you graduate. And obviously my question is going to be, and why is graduating a good thing? Okay, so you can get a better job, maybe make some more money. Okay, so why do you want more money? Okay, so money is something that can contribute to happiness. So good. So we have a nice hierarchy where something is valuable because it contributes to something else. Class, that's valuable because it contributes to something else. Graduating, right? Thank you. Graduating is good because that will get you a better job. A better job is good because it will get you better money. And money is good because it contributes to your happiness. Okay, so there's a nice step. There might be alternative answers. Uh, maybe somebody likes uh, coming to class because they want to get a good education, independent of whether it's going to get them a better job. Maybe somebody thinks that education itself is valuable. Maybe somebody thinks that they want to be a kind of person who's an educated person, whether that makes them more money or not. Okay, so here we have a discussion of that.